Hello there, Westworld fans. I'm back with the Nerd Soup panel. Aaron and Marissa, three man group today. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Two man, one woman. Group. Oh, my <laughs> God. <sighs> three firefighters. All ready to talk about Westworld Season 2, Episode 9. You see that Michael B. Jordan movie with Michael Shannon? Yeah. I heard Why? it was awful. Yeah. <laughs> I hear God he's good. Critics don't like it, but audiences, audiences love it. Yeah, they love it, <laughs> according to MoviePass. Uh, today we're going to be talking about something good. Something great, possibly. Episode 9 of Westworld Season 2. I don't know where I would rank it. I feel like people mock us in the comments, too. They're like, every week they say, I don't know if this is my favorite episode, but... That's the question I have. Every single week, they keep blowing my mind. Last week with uh, Akichita, that was a great episode. This week, um, but I don't think I've anticipated anything more than this finale than maybe like Star Wars Episode Seven, and for you, Batman v Superman. <laughs> <laughs> well, way to bring up bad memories. <laughs> I think I've been pretty strong on my stance that I thought uh, Episode Four was, has been the best, and I think still is this season. What are you, a politician? <laughs> <laughs> I have not once ever said that there was a better episode than Episode 4. X not or Episode 4. <laughs> you guys know the thing, right? I Good old it. Reagan. <laughs> I was going to say LBJ. <laughs> it's in uh, between. Yeah, some, some, yeah somewhere in the middle. Well, that's my train of thought. Jimmy uh, Carter. Yeah. <laughs> Stop naming presidents. Are you just naming presidents now? <laughs> Franklin Pierce. A lot of people don't people forget, people about, forget yeah. about Franklin Pierce, what he did. See the one that got stuck in the bathtub? Uh no, that was um <laughs> no Taft. It was definitely Taft. Yeah, Taft was yeah, a big Taft. fella. Yeah. A big walrus. <laughs> yeah. What do you think about who's your favorite president, Marissa? <laughs> My favorite president? Yeah. Who's your Mount Rushmore of presidents? My Mount Rushmore of presidents. They already have one of those. Yeah, but I want Marissa's. How would she carve it? I don't know. I haven't thought about this. That's a lot of pressure, right? Top four? Yeah. Top four. Calvin. Just stick, stick to the classics so no one yells at you. Calvin, Cleveland, Adams, Jefferson. There's my Mount Rushmore. That's great. Uh, yeah, but episode nine, I thought. <laughs> yeah, let's get into this episode. Yeah. Very intriguing episode. I was so, raised so many questions for me. I really liked it, but I feel like I think we definitely said this a lot of times on the podcast where going back, I think this one, especially after the finale, is going to be one you go back to when you're rewatching and be like, oh. That makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Because a couple times, I'm, I think too hard during these episodes. I'm trying to piece it together. I got subtitles up. I'm pausing every five seconds. I'm like, oh, that's a clue. It's not a clue. And, <laughs> But I think this one is going to be a lot to delve into, especially when we know how this is all going to end, especially for William's story. Yeah, throughout the season, I've been trying to refrain from reading other people's theories because I don't want to be accused of stealing. And I know that the community likes to share ideas, but I've been refraining. This episode, no, I read everything. I read anything that anybody had to say about this episode because there's so many lines, there's so many ambiguous lines that characters say in this episode. There's so many moments where it can mean any. I mean, the two bathtubs. I'm just writing down quotes and everything. Emily yeah, and I saw and William. Who's a host? Who's not a host? I saw like Hacks, Hacks Dog when he like retweeted or tweeted something with the two different bathtub gifts. I'm like, ah, oh, well, fuck. What the you hell? What the hell that, is that? You sent me that picture of the screen cap with the split down the middle and that I hadn't even noticed when I watched yeah, what the, the, fuck is that? For the first time. <laughs> what, the, what? I literally freaked out. I was I, like, what's going on? I, it's, it's, at, it's at the point where I'm not going to try. It's like, oh, maybe the two bathtubs are this or the split is this. I think the split is kind of just like the two maybe flashbacks coming together where we see the different uh, grade, color gradings on certain scenes and from the cradle and from what we see in different timelines. I think it could be something where it just splits open and, and, it, and it joins uh, the, uh, the same grading of a different timeline. But that's probably not it. It's probably something else. And I'm not even to think about it because my head turns to mush. I'll tell you what, because I've been one of the biggest defenders of season two. I think I like it not as much as season one, but I think it's right there. They've ha they have a lot riding on this finale. Yeah. Because if the finale is underwhelming, because it's a mystery box season. Season one was we were discovering the mystery with the characters. Now in season two, the characters know the end game. They're aware of what's going on for the most part. It's we as the audience don't know where it's heading. So I feel like if it's not something mind blowing in the season finale, season two kind of it almost becomes a waste. It's, it's, it's been, a risk. It's been up and down. There's definitely been some not great episodes to the standard that we saw in season one. But yeah, like you said, it's like, I feel like everyone knows it's a pretty audience. Right, but I'm it's saying like the whole season as a whole, it's all been leading up to this one moment. If it's not great, then what were we doing throughout season two? I read recently, I forget what outlet it was in. It might have been The Atlantic. Um, Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joyce talk specifically about how they want to like dismantle the whole mystery box thing. Like instead of just keeping it a mystery, they want to, I guess, explore the inner workings of the mystery box plot. So I think we'll definitely get the answers we want, but I don't know if it'll be next episode. Right. And then I think it's just an, a question of whether if those answers satisfy us for a season finale. 
I can, I can appreciate a cliffhanger, but the cliffhanger in season one felt like, okay, all the major questions were answered, but there's obviously still more story that they can tell. I need another cliffhanger like that for season two. I, it'll I, be two years until we get the next season. Well, I think they had they did that because the new Game of Thrones was going to take a while, and they needed that lead into the summer series to carry that time slot. I know they had some production problems, too. They did, too? Okay. And it's also not a story that, you know, you sit back and you write it in three months. There's obviously there's some, a lot of planning that goes into Westworld. But I guess we'll start with this episode. The question that I'll ponder to you guys is, William, host? Not a host? I don't fucking know anymore, <laughs> man. Um, I, I think it. it would be cool if he was. I'm still on the fence on whether he actually is. I saw a theory that imagine if there's been two Williams this whole time and then the real William and host William come face to face. But I mean, they already did the two survives. Williams thing. Uh, no, but I'm saying like Ford. <laughs> they both think they're Ford. <laughs> <laughs> that would be funny. But it's like, oh, William, William. And it's that old uh, like Emily's looking at both of them and she doesn't know which one's her real father. It's like, you gotta like s- no, I led your mother to suicide. Well, I was a bad father. <laughs> it's like, I don't know who it is. It's like, watch me forget more of your childhood memories. <laughs> Hey, William, you got a stain on your shirt. <laughs> you got anything to get out this stain, other William? <laughs> I don't. Uh, yeah, I don't know. We see at the end, obviously, and he cuts into his arm, kind of like that ex machina scene. When right, but he was doing that throughout the episode, even in the first. He kept looking at it, yeah. yeah. But he never, he's like, all right, fuck it. I think he just. I'm, he's lost, too. He's like, all right, I'm just going to cut it open and find out once and for all. I think it's, like you said, Caleb Smith and ex machina, where he thinks that he could be a robot. Even Felix in season one, where he's like looking around Am I a host? No, Felix. You're you're a human, okay? You can't be part of our club. I think William simply is just losing his mind, and he wants to become a host. Because even in the first scene when he's at the celebration where we figure out that he was donating money to his daughter's charities, and he has a conversation with his wife where she says, what could be better than this? A celebration for you. And he looks over to the waitress, and he sees Dolores. So maybe it does tie all the way back into Dolores that... She was the one that made him obsessed with the park in the first place. He just imagined that he saw Dolores. Right. Yeah. But you can maybe so it's s- not even that he actually saw her. It's, it's, once again, it's a figment of his mind. You can maybe make the argument, too, that he's kind of in his own loop. Maybe not, not within the park, but just in his life in general, where he kept looking at his arm, and that was obviously a little bit in the past. So maybe he's done that before where he tried to dig in. It seemed to cause him a little pain, too. So it might have just been like in his own like loop where he gets to this point at every certain time where he just slowly loses his mind and then kind of just starts over again and now he's at the time where he's questioning his reality again and he digs in again yeah uh, and i've also seen theories that because even some of the lines that juliet says in this episode they feel like they're being spoken by somebody that's not a human when she keeps questioning is this real are you real tell me the truth tell me one true thing i, I don't know there's a lot to play with here especially because they introduced the forge in this episode which is basically, it's not the antithesis of the cradle, but it's a different version of the cradle where the cradle contained the backups for all the hosts, all the narratives. The forge, they seem to be duplicating guest consciousness inside of the forge, or cognition, as Emily calls it. So that just throws a whole, where everything that we understand about the show can be flipped on its head because of the forge. Because when you look at the shots for the preview, the forge encompasses not only the park, but it's the Westworld Mesa. It also looks like it's Logan's home that might not even be on the same island. At this point, it could be like everything that happened could just be in the fucking forge. And right. It's like, like oh. the Matrix. Yeah. And I don't know, man. I I really <laughs> ask these questions. There's just so many different outcomes. Well, let's talk options. about character moments. What did you think about uh, Stella Ward's performance as Juliet? I thought she Logan's was great. Part? Yeah, she was very great. Uh, I thought, especially that scene when she's kind of losing it at the end and Emily at the house and Emily comes in and she's like, oh, he doesn't love you. He doesn't love me. You could see and that William was almost down. Yeah. pitting them against each other. That he strategically had Emily come to the house that night. Well, we see throughout the episode, especially in the flashbacks, that Emily is Team William. Yeah. This whole yeah. back and forth. That surprised me a little bit because of how much their relationship has deteriorated by the time we first see them interact. I thought there would have been more tension leading up to the mother's suicide. Right. She says in phase space, I think it's phase space, that everybody was fooled by your nice guy act, including me. So they had a strong relationship even back then. And she, Julia tries to tell Emily, your father is sick. And Emily's thinking, no, you're, you're the one who's sick. You have an addiction problem. You're losing your mind. We need to send you back to the hospital. Once again, William is kind of sitting there like the helpless puppy. That's why I think he planned it. I think he planned to have them pit against each I other. I thought while watching that that he seemed very, not necessarily emotionless, but not as affected by the situation as I would have thought he had been. The whole time he feels like he's not even there. I mean, even the opening scene when he's talking with that that rich guy whatever oh jack yeah talking about like alexander don't don't whatever jack 
Fuck Jack. Jack's a big time that player. Was such like a, douchebag. This is how rich people talk conversation. Yeah, like, he's talking about like how Alexander <laughs> wept when he heard there are infinite worlds because he's yet to conquer one. He's like, oh, yeah, poor people only read for some reason. Plutarch. Yeah, I had to go dust off the old library. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, William's just very disinterested. He really doesn't care. I'm poor and I read Star Wars books. <laughs> I'm not rooting Plutarch. <laughs> but he's not in that. It feels like he's not in that moment. Like you can just tell he hates the real world, and that's when he sees Dolores instead of the waitress. His mind's always on where he believes he should be. Something interesting I found about William was that he's very obsessed with choice. He's always like accusing other people of being hosts. He's very concerned if he's a host. But he talks about this darkness inside him as something that was always there and something he had no control over. Um, and I just found that very odd for someone like him. Like he doesn't consider that this is the way he is now is out of his control and not something that he had an active choice in. Like all the choices he made led him to this point. It wasn't like a divine power was pushing him towards it. Yeah. And I guess it's almost the free will debate that we've had, too, because when you see Dolores, she's really had no choice in the choices that she's had to make in season two because she's trying to escape the park. But those choices led her to change Teddy where she was taking the the option to choose away from him. And you mentioned that the their arcs, William and Dolores, kind of run parallel in this episode. Yeah, when you consider that William talks about this darkness that's in him, that he just revealed itself one day. I feel like similarly, um, Dolores with her Wyatt personality, yeah. it's been there forever, but it wasn't something she was able to access until recently. Um, so it's almost as if it's the same thing for William, or that's how he feels about it. Uh, especially because they've both pushed away their loved ones and as a result their loved ones committed suicide to get away from the people that they are yeah bernard a little bit too because he pushes away elsie in this episode but elsie's gonna live forever elsie yeah right right that is true and with william and dolores it's interesting because like you said william acts like this darkness is something that is has always been there but it's not a consequences it's not a consequence of the choice that he's made or the choices that he continues to make whereas Dolores her choices like I said it's she's had no choice she has to fight back she has to be ruthless if she wants to escape that's what it brings up the idea is William trying to escape something is he inside if is he trapped in a way that we're not aware of and the conversation with Ford too it's a very because Ford reveals that he knows about Dallas's project and the line that's very interesting to me is that he says have you ever considered what your project is learning about its subjects? And he uses the word it. So that makes me think that the Forge, because Elsie called um, the cradle a hive mind. So the Forge, you have all this information, you have all this data swimming around. And what it has been learning is that the guests of Westworld are terrible people. So what is the Forge going to do with all that information if it became sentient somehow? If the Forge f figures out a way to fight back? Well, interesting. I guess we'll talk about that now. But even before that, he's just... They're, they're reference the agreement they have like Delos stays out of the narratives and my question is was it the hats that's how Ford figured out that Delos was kind of snooping around the park maybe that's a little what do you think about that too the scanners and the hats the technology is getting it's almost like you have to suspend your disbelief someone tweeted it I forgot who it was but it's like oh, Delos' whole like master plan relies on their guests wearing a hat <laughs> Yeah, that's what I thought. I was very, like, I wanted to know how the hats worked. How could they guarantee people were wearing their hats all the time? Like, I get, like, ugh, you just have to, yeah. like, I can't ask questions about this stuff anymore because I don't really need to know. Was that what you mean with the hat? Because Ford says William broke the arrangement? that is using Right, the, yeah. because the profiles were being recorded, I was assuming. It's a collection of the data that they're collecting through the collecting through the scanners and also the visual footage that they have from the host control units that's why i was saying you have to suspend your disbelief because i don't know how that technology is working you're just scanning somebody's brain and that's how you're painting a picture of their cognition because emily says i understand how you can get their dna that's easy you know you swab their spit from the hosts or you collect all their just going around spitting on hosts well, well you're collecting all their bodily fluids while they're in the park but it that technology is so complex and so futuristic, it's recreating a consciousness. And I know that people are trying to do this in real life, but... In 10 years, who knows? Jeff Bezos probably... He's probably doing this shit already. You think Jeff, Jeff Bezos... Oh, he's... All... In 20 years, when he has an age, we're going to be like, that Jeff Bezos, you're just so healthy. <laughs> I am Jeff rock, Bezos, rock, version rock, number three. Rock. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great scene, though, when they're talking. I mean, Ford references William's humble beginnings. It's kind of twice they reference that in the, the episode. Again, yeah. big, rich, big shot over there in the beginning. And uh, his wife mentions it, too. She was like, oh, you were the poor kid with the shabby suit. That's why you stood out. And then I realized that you were just better at faking than everybody else. <laughs> Fake it till you make it. 
Yeah, but that Ford, well, Ford tells him there's one more game that I have to play. And well, Emily, too. What did you guys think? Do you think Emily is a host? I'm on team. Emily is a host. I, don't I hope know. for William's sake. That's some pretty fucked up shit. How fucked up was that scene? I, that felt really permanent to me. <laughs> the fact that he killed her. It was also terrifying. Like, because I feel like the whole show, we've known that William is like low key losing his mind. But it was this scene that it became like really stark. For me she is so shaken up too and she's like yeah looking, i was like th- th- those are real people she looks terrified and then he kills her and i was like you can't take this back like death in this show for the most part because it's mostly hosts dying um because they can just be brought back it hasn't felt like a real thing and this was the first death that really hit me even when ford died because he's he's been back so it i was like if she's not a host like he'll never this will never be undone and he finds the, the profile like oh <laughs> My bad. <laughs> yeah, but he doesn't even mourn for her, it looks like. Even he's in that moment. Before, he, when he puts the gun up to his head, he's flashing back to the moments of him and Emily. I think he's mourning in the only way that, at this point, he can. It sort of felt like he was in shock, I guess, as much as like we've seen William express a lot of emotion as, as an adult, I guess, or the older version of him. I just... Yeah, the difference like finding out your daughter died and you you're the one that's actually doing it because you're having a mental breakdown. I sort of felt like he was realizing a whole bunch of things were, that were his fault at once, and then that's when he put the gun to his head. I guess it's a... Con- I mean, it is a problem that you could have if you're in the park for so long, you start to lose your grip on reality and you accidentally kill your daughter. It's Shakespearean yeah. in a way. It's like a that Shakespearean old. tragic. Yeah, that old thing. <laughs> um, I'm trying... I feel like this has happened before. I'm tr- I just can't remember what story it is. Yeah, I, I I, don't know. I think it's also a combination. If William is trying to justify killing his daughter because if he's a host, then it's not technically his daughter. So I think it's a combination of that. It's the shock of him actually killing his daughter. And then, oh, if I'm a host, then it doesn't matter because I just killed somebody else that had no relation to me. I think Emily is a host because they don't... When they check the man in black's neck, it clears for him. For Emily, they don't show it. I guess it was Emily throughout the whole episode. I mean, she's kind of... Don't you think... I, I feel like she's acting weird, though. Like, the actress is purposely being told... She's Even when she said, oh, those are real people, the way she said it, she's like, those are real people. You killed them. If she was a real person, she'd be like, what the fuck? Those were real people. What's wrong with you? She was just kind of like, uh. Ah. No, I she didn't really get that impression that. from it. I, I disagree. I feel like that was... Like, of the, all the reactions you can have to, like, watching your dad kill actual people and realizing he's unhinged, I feel like how she reacted was fine. Maybe, but I also feel like that could be a very a host reaction. It's not a human being, because if she is a host, then she's not awake. Have you she's seen just the, following Ford's command. Have you seen the side-by-side of her and Carrie Fisher from A New Hope? No. Identical. Next time you see her face. I don't you, think so. Oh, there's a side-by-side, identical. Just it's, a little. it's the eyes, I think. Something about their eyes. Yeah. Quick little Millie Bobby there. Brown. That's your Princess Leia. Well, for another unneeded Star Wars story. Hey, man, they get to keep on milking that cow with the blue milk from The Last Jedi. Uh, my favorite scene of the episode, and I just love Anthony Hopkins, Ford and Maeve. What a scene between these two characters where we finally get the... Finally, Ford reveals that he was the one who was changing Maeve's code in season one, and he considers Maeve to be his daughter, which I thought that was almost a meta moment by the show creators where they were saying... You guys like this character, right? Yeah, yeah that's She's exactly our what too. I thought. Yeah. <laughs> it's like we had no idea how much you guys were going to like Maeve. She's Ford's favorite, too. <laughs> Once again, he's given another misanthropic monologue where he's talking about how Maeve has to share the world with these men of stone. Creatures, he calls Creatures them. of stone, right? I feel like it was almost one last push for Maeve to take on that leadership role. Because everybody's heading to the forge and they want to do something different with it. Maeve is the only one who's going there with no intention of using it. Yeah, so. she's very, uh, like we said before, she's the most human character, human host. Yeah, it's a great scene. Like, we've actually seen like Ford with some hint of emotion, <laughs> finally. Well, you could hear the rumbling sadness in his voice. He was yeah. like trying to keep himself from crying. I thought he was going to like kill her or like do, sn- not like kill her, but like do, like put her out of her misery, I guess. Like do right. something in her code that would turn her off. Um, instead, he just unlocked her and gave her a fighting chance. And he was like, I'm doing the same thing that you're trying to do for your daughter. And I love that. I wish Maeve could have spoken back. The two alpha dog personalities in the show, you know, the two. We'll, we'll catch them. But I they always have... get the last word in every conversation. I just wanted them. In season one, I wanted them to have a sass competition. Like, who can get the last word with the clever saying? I would and have loved to know what in. she would have said to him in that moment. <laughs> because she. she the te- tear, how yeah. good was she, though? When you don't. She's not even speaking. You could feel the sadness on her face when that one tear. Oh, 
Both Danny of them Newton. were fantastic. Yeah. A little maybe a guest actor for four, uh, Anthony Hopkins. A little Emmy. A little something to put on his uh, mantle. He needs it. Yeah. He's a good kid. <laughs> I like when uh, old established actors I got under the radar, never appreciated for their work, finally get one award. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that Daniel Day Lewis kid, man. <laughs> He's another one. He should definitely get one. He needs to get. It. He needs to work in bigger movies, maybe Marvel. Um, <laughs> what do you? What did you think that? What do you think Ford did to her code? Because I think it's it's going to be in relation to what happened with Clementine, where Clementine is basically Samuel Jackson and Kingsman, where she can make all the hosts. If if Maeve doesn't have a scene where she's killing all the hosts to that Leonard Skinner song from Kingsman, I'll be very upset. <laughs> very upset. What do you think he did? Some yeah, well, bleeding edge armor? He basically leveled her up. Yeah, again, I mean, he's... Was it, what'd you say it said on the little still? Well, uh, when you freeze the frame, it says Arnold.01. It also says core something unlocked. Core permissions. Co- yeah, which I thought she had broken through all of her permissions. Right. So I don't know what there was left to unlock. I mean, she probably still has a lot of, like, human elements to her, just being made in a human image as a host. So he probably... She can't move right now. She's obviously pretty torn up maybe he just unlocked everything where she can't feel pain or she's able to fix herself up because right now Healing hell says factor. before they have no regard for her so she needs to do something and doesn't look like they're gonna patch her up so I do you think it's in relation to the forge because we haven't heard ford yet mention the forge so it's like a core permission that allows her to access the forge without abernathy's encryption key because Abernathy's control unit looks like it's going to be the key that opens the door to the forge because there's a shot where Dolores is placing the control unit down and then we see Bernard picking it up later in a scene without Dolores. Maybe this is a core permission to access all that data, to to gain control of it. Because even Bernard says, imagine if one host got access to all of that data. And the last time we see, before Ford has that conversation with Maeve, he sends Bernard off and then Bernard mentions the Forge. How did Bernard learn about it? It had to have been from Ford. That's why I'm thinking it's all connected here. Well, I think Bernard's still there. I mean, they kind of cut out, and she's having that like moment with like the sounds, and then they cut out. And right, then... but I'm saying that Ford told Bernard about the forge, and then he gifted Maeve that upgrade. Probably. Okay. I don't, know. <laughs> I don't fucking know anymore, man. <laughs> I don't know, because, yeah, well, I guess we'll go to Bernard and Elsie. And once again, it's that father-daughter relationship where the father kind of lets down the daughter. Elsie has to go to dental school. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, Bernard. <laughs> she's like, what's, what's that elf movie, the animated movie? When the elf just wants to be a dentist. Land Before Time? No, it's a Christmas movie. Elf? <laughs> no. No, I know cartoon. what you're talking about, and I can't remember. It's the elf. He wants called. to be a dentist. Oh, Rudolph. Yes. Oh, is it Rudolph? I think it's Rudolph. Yeah. yeah, the elf wants to be a dentist. Yeah. Stop motion. Yep. We should do a stop motion one day. I don't have the patience for that. Yeah, Bernard and Elsie. And once again, it's Bernard. He's trying to get Ford out of his head, and he says, I can delete it. And Ford is like, Yes, you can. You're the only one who can. And then Ford just disappears. Do you think he's actually gone, or do you think he let Bernard delete him and he's just kind of like chilling out somewhere? I think he's chilling out. I think he's kicking back. It felt the way finale. too easy for him to like the code was highlighted and he was just like, "Okay, trash can." Like, well, in the preview, he's in the preview. <laughs> in the preview trailer, Ford is there. Looks <laughs> like a little paperclip showed up. It's like, are you sure you want to delete Ford from your system? <laughs> also, I want to know why. I, like, does Ford hate other humans that much that he just wanted Bernard to kill Elsie? Do you think there was a reason he wanted him to kill Elsie? I think he realizes that Elsie is probably the most rational human being ever. <laughs> so she's the closest to what Ford would consider a good person. So Ford can't have Bernard hanging out with good people. No. He needs hosts that are on the same page as Ford. He was trying so hard. He was like, she's going to kill you. Eventually, she's going to realize that you might betray her, and she'll kill you for it. And Bernard was like, but she's nice to me. <laughs> but I like her. <laughs> yeah, Elsie seems kind of like, she has a mix of like, oh, that's the Bernard I I love and admired when we were working together. And, oh, it's also a host that can be keeping information from me and could snap at any time. And He's also, like, already locked me up in yeah, a Yeah, he literally attacked me last season, so. I would be really upset if they revealed Elsie was working for Charlotte Hale or had an ulterior motive. That if she wasn't just a character that she's not good, she's not bad, but she'll do the moral thing if the situation pre- presents itself. That she's not working for anybody but herself. She's just a coder who got the job at Westworld. But if they reveal that she's secretly been working for somebody, I would be upset with yeah. that change. I like the things like, you know, they offered a good uh, benefit program, good 401k. Dental. Dental. <laughs> but like you said, that he keeps pushing her him to kill Elsie. 
which so that also, makes me think what is Elsie up to yeah I, we've had a lot of focus on Elsie and part of me just thinks it's because they got rid of her so early last season and people wouldn't stop bothering them about it so they were like fine here's Elsie um but all the emphasis like they I feel like they're not focusing on just Bernard in those scenes like I feel like Elsie has to do something eventually too the season finale Ford has a scene with Elsie <laughs> hello you're always my favorite program <laughs> I should have just let you go to dental school. <laughs> Open the door. I don't know about that. Um, well, um, we have Dolores, Teddy, and Ghost Nation. Once again, another interesting conversation where these these host characters that are all headed in the same direction, they have a different perception of what the door is, what valley, what the valley beyond is, what the forge is. Dolores tells him that it's their chance at immortality. One of Akichita's right-hand men tell her that it's a place where you don't deserve to go. It's a door to a new world. And Teddy... So we, old Teddy creeping back in there. Yeah, I like that. It's like the nicest character ever, and she turned him into a murdering monster. I want that old Teddy back, and we do kind of get him. But uh, even before that, too, like Dolores, when she's when she's saying all that thing, like the journey, like her journey ends here, and the valley beyond is not meant for her. And Dolores says it's meant for. Well, I think even when he kill when she kills a member of Ghost Nation, and she says, "I told you, friend, not all of us deserve to go to the valley beyond." I think she means, "I don't deserve it. You don't deserve it. It wasn't built for us." And that's when Ford says that this game was built for you because it was Delos that started this project. Well, yeah, she says, yeah, it's meant for the people who made this place and the tool for their immortality, but she's going to use it against them somehow. Um, if it's Dolores just destroying it, okay. She's going to use it against them. She has to, that's yeah. not just destroying it. Um, they've placed a lot of emphasis on how Dolores is going to use it as a weapon. So if she just destroyed it, that's not turning it into a weapon. That's just destroying the forge. So how... What does she do down there that hurts other people besides just destroying, I guess, their IP? Yeah, I don't think we're smart enough to know <laughs> or to guess. Yeah, that's why I'm so I'm s really anticipating this finale because there's just so many potential ways that they can end it with the forge, with this simulation. Anything is possible. So and going back to the Teddy stuff too, I like how they kind of hint at it a little bit. Teddy has to wait for Dolores to say something to start shooting. Oh, Where, she was like uh, Teddy. Uh, Teddy. <laughs> And then he starts going off. And we've seen in the episodes before, when she first changed him, he just shot no questions asked. So you kind of saw that little creep in before we actually see him put his gun down. And he lets one of the members of Ghost Nation go free. Yeah. He's yeah, I think by that point, he's fully conscious. I, I read a theory that this was his awakening. Him yeah. being changed and then him still having to be with Dolores. It was that conflict that... Up until that point, I don't think Teddy was aware that he was a host and everything going on, but I don't know if he was capable of remembering everything that happened to him, like he says in the end. Like, he remembers the first time he ever saw Dolores, which was super creepy, by the way. Well, it was. Doesn't yeah. Dolores upload that to him, though? When they finally, when she finally, when they're in the Met Mesa, she shows him all the stuff that happened. Yeah. But I don't know if he remembered it himself. I feel like there's a yeah, difference being Yeah, it felt like told. he was being shown it, and he was like, oh, my God, this is terrible. Oh, man, And then he kind of just went on with this. But then he was still, even then, he was still insisting on them stopping, that he didn't even want to continue on the path after finding out what they were doing to him. But he kind of remembers his old narratives, too. It's like, oh. Yeah, he doesn't remember the suffering. That's yeah. why I felt this was a, it's suffering in a new way, because she basically took herself away from teddy but because they could no longer have that relationship even at the end when he does kill himself they have the back and forth when we used to be in love and dolores is like used to be oh <laughs> that was really i had a heart you're breaking too. right now <laughs> teddy you're breaking my heart <laughs> you're going down a path that i designed for you and i <laughs> yeah i'm just gonna kill myself <laughs> that's crazy uh but he has, yeah, he has that conflict though, where he, if he, if that was his awakening too, but he still can't break that code that's essential to his character of having to stand by Dolores. So he still has to end his life to break that, that loop, sort of. That was sad, man. Yeah. And that was control unit. My man is dead. Oh, we'll, we'll see Teddy again. But the thing is, how does he end up in the valley? Because there's no way Dolores is dragging him on the back of the horse. It seems like they, well, also in the preview, she was like holding his dead body yeah. in a pile a puddle of blood which well, they're, they're close because i'm assuming when the entire valley floods like it also gets him in the house because they find the ghost nation member that they saw in season one with the video of the lawyers killing him that just happened this episode so they didn't get too far away from that area and bernard right. was close to that area when they found a body anyway the reason that i even think the reason that i continue to think that emily is a host because i think she knows her father well enough to know because william is skeptical the whole time when she's talking about I want in on the project, and he's saying the Emily that I knew would found would have found this abhorrent. She wouldn't have supported this, and 
it was a bad decision by Emily to lie to her father, to try to mislead him. You have to know that this guy, this is the man in black. This dude is clever. This dude is 10 steps ahead. He's, he's like diet forward almost. You're not going to fool him by saying, oh, I want in on your terrible thing that obviously you know I would hate. I guess if she was playing the angle, I want to bring mom back to life. I guess that's a little bit more convincing. It's kind of morbid, though. That wasn't even her angle. She was just like, I want to know why mom did it. Right. She says, oh, to give mom a second chance, but then she gets away from that right away. Well, so. I think the skepticism creeps in early early for William. I mean, you hear the voiceover. I guess he's reflecting to himself when he hears Juliet say, is this real? Are you real? And then Emily comes in right away. So I think he applies that to Emily at first. Then later on in the episode, he applies it to himself after he realizes Emily what he thinks she's not a host and even the whole thing when he's like oh how'd you find me here it's a huge place you can look for someone for months and you won't find them and she says oh maybe it was fate he's not having any of that yeah that's why she keeps saying things that they're playing with it obviously by not even showing us the scanner that's i that's why i think she's a host man i really do and what do you think about the two bathtubs one of them is william i didn't even notice that until you told me i don't even i hate this show (laughs) (laughs) well the white one is his wife and then there's another bathtub where it's red and it's kind of filled with blood. Yeah, so that's, that's what I thought. I thought she might have, like, dextered herself. Like, in Dexter, one of the killers cuts his, the femoral artery, I think. That's what it's called, on their legs. And they filled the bathtub with blood. So I'm like, oh, they probably did something like that to kill themselves. Then we see Juliet, and she has the bottle of pills. Right. And William mentions that in season one, that it was probably an overdose of her medication. So we probably should have suspected this from the beginning. Why would there be blood? A lot of people think that it's William who's in the red bathtub that's overflowing with blood. And I guess they make the connection where he's constantly digging into his wrist in this episode. So maybe he finally decides it's a combination of him trying to figure out if he's a host and he also kills himself. But who who shot would that be? Because it feels like everything we see is either from someone's perspective or someone remembering something. I guess just the audience perspective. Yeah. Unless he's a host and he's but that's remembering not like, that's... his own death. How's that a flash forward? I've, yeah. I've heard that as well, that it's yeah. he's remembering it as a host, and that's just his perception of what happened. And because he's such a big part of the park and the company and everything, they're like, let's just quietly clone him. Because yeah, it wouldn't make sense to have a flash forward from an audience perspective. I don't think that, that doesn't really align with how we've seen things in the past in the show. Yeah, it would be different. I don't know. It could be Emily. could be the real Emily. That's maybe what happened to the real Emily, but then William would know about that. He's just fucking he's nuts, man. Yeah. That is true. So what do you guys think is, what are your predictions? I know it's tough, but if you had to make any predictions about what's happening in the forge, because we see Bernard and Dolores, they're in the forge. Bernard is on the beach. Do you think Bernard is caught in a loop? What is Logan doing in the forge? Is he kind of their guide? What's Ford's end game here? Um, <laughs> Logan might be in the core character. All right, I'm Logan. How's you guys going here? <laughs> I think... This is the forge. <laughs> <laughs> I think that maybe Dolores is going to want to use all the host human hosts or the duplicated consciousness that are in the f- consciousnesses is, that are <laughs> I think you nailed that one. <laughs> <laughs> that are um in the forge as maybe like an army, who knows? And then Bernard's like you can't do that, which is why he blows the whole place up. He thinks that he's killing himself when he blows up the forge and he floods it whatever he does and then he washes up on the beach and he's like this wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> uh why am I alive? I'm not even going to try to make my prediction. <laughs> I don't even... I, yeah, I just kind of want to watch I kind of want to take it in, yeah. yeah. Uh, even though I just dropped a prediction video. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's for the views, you know? <laughs> yeah. That's why you do Game of Thrones Revisited. <laughs> well, no, that's that's a passion project. Okay. Okay. <laughs> for who? Teddy. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't really want to watch the episodes. Like, can you guys just do a little rundown for me? All right, so that's our Westworld Episode 9 Season 2 review. Uh, we'll be back next week. Um, can't wait for that. Can't wait for that finale. Then we got to do we'll do a Westworld Revisited. <laughs> to go through all three seasons. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we need something to do. Next Revisited is SpongeBob. Early seasons, when it was funny. One through four. <laughs>